All right. That first angel asks us, number one, to fear God. What's the second thing he asks us to do? Give glory to him. And the third? Worship him. There it is. So, is the Bible a book that will explain itself? Yes, it will explain itself. So, let's find out what this means. Fear God. Psalm 111 verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom so that's your mind first corinthians chapter 6 verse 20 says to glorify god in your body and in john 4 23 it says we worship god in spirit and in truth so do you see what this first angel is calling for complete commitment to god fear god with your mind give glory to him in your body and worship him in your spirit now is there anything left for the devil no, God's got it all. Now you don't have to worry about the second and third angel. The second angel says Babylon has fallen, has fallen. The third angel talks about the mark of the beast. If you don't want to fall like Babylon fell, if you don't want to receive the mark of the beast, then simply follow the first angel. Fear God with your mind, give glory to him in your body, and worship him in your spirit then you will not fall like Babylon fell. You cannot receive the mark of the beast because you have the seal of God. So how do you make that happen? How do I follow that first angel? I believe the answer is found in a devotional life. When I went to Pacific Union College, Pastor Morris Venden was my pastor as well as my Bible teacher. And I was a brand new Adventist, just a year old. So bless his heart. In class, I was always raising my hand. i say, what's that? Who's this? I don't know this. Talk about the woman at the well. What woman? What well? <laughs> but he was very patient and very kind and leading us on. But he had a special alternative class uh, that met at 6 o'clock in the morning because he wanted to weed out those who were idle. So this class met at 6 in the morning. It was a special class that he had created as a worship option and he wanted to address the issue of any students who are not really sure about their salvation or who would like to grow stronger in their relationship with Christ. And in this class, he gave us a two-week challenge. He told us students, for the next two weeks, I want you to spend 15 minutes a day reading your Bible, praying, and then telling somebody what you got out of that. He said, if you will do this for two weeks, I can promise you something significant will happen in your life. And it's not that he promised us, it's God promised us. In James chapter 4, verse 8, it says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. You take one tiny uncertain step toward God, he's going to take a giant loving leap toward you. You can't outdo God, but it's fun to try. He said, if you'll do this, something significant. And I thought, okay, I'm in, I'm in. I'm new, I don't know all these things, but I'm going to do this. And if nothing happens in the two weeks, I'm going to go up to him and say, it didn't work, you got something else. But I took the two-week challenge. And two, work, two weeks turned into two more weeks, and two more weeks, and two more months, and two more years, and two more decades. And now, 50 years later, it's more than 15 minutes. So, <clears throat> after I finished my two years at PUC, I transferred out to Union College in Nebraska for my last two years. And... When I got there, the dean assigned me to a roommate, I didn't get a choice, a medical student. And I said, Dean, why, why did you give me a medical student? I'm a theology major. You usually trying to pair us up so that we can work with each other and help each other. And he said, Paul, he said, Larry had a bad year last year and he almost got kicked out several times. 
And at the end of the year, he came to me with tears in his eyes and said, Dean, I need a spiritually strong roommate this year or I know I'm not going to make it. So give me the best you got. And the dean said, I saw your transfer letter from PUC. You are a member of the 70, which is an exclusive club. You are handpicked by the chaplain's office to witness to your fellow students on campus. So they were called the 70, which is what Jesus sent out to witness. And he said, Larry, this guy Paul, apparently he shoots both hips, both barrels at the same time. Are you sure you want him for a roommate? He said, that's exactly who I need for a roommate. So I moved in with Larry, medical student. And after about a month, he said, okay, Volk, how do you do it? I said, do what? He said, come on, man, you're too slick. How do you do it? I said, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, look, I was raised in Adventist. The stuff that's been going on in this last month has never happened to me before. And I said, what do you mean? And he says, well, sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and you're out of bed kneeling down and praying. What are you doing that in the middle of the night for? And I said, well, sometimes the Lord wakes me up. And we have over a 1,000 students and faculty here on this campus. And the Lord said, get out of bed and start praying for them. And I do, because we're all in this together. We're trying to get through. And he says, well, what about the guys that come into the room at night? And I said, well, some of them are having a struggle with some issues in their lives. And, and they, they come into the room and, uh, or wake me up in the middle of the night and say, Paul, you got to pray for this. I'm, I'm not getting through. And so I pray for them. <laughs> one time I heard there were four or five of them in a car headed down to the liquor store. And one of them said, wait, before we go to the liquor store, let's stop off in Paul's room. Well, they did, and they never made it to the liquor store. And Larry said, well, I, I want this to happen in my life. How, how can I have this happen in, in my life? And I said, well, Larry, I'm going to give you the same challenge Pastor Bannon gave us at PUC. And it worked. It always works. And he said, what is it? I'll do anything. I want what you've got. I said, for the next two weeks, spend 15 minutes a day reading your Bible and praying, and then tell somebody what you got from that experience. He said, is that it? I said, yep, that's it. And he said, what if nothing happens at the end of the two weeks? I said, throw away your Bible, leave the church, there is no God. He said, what? And I said, yes. He promised James 4.8, you draw near to him, he'll draw near to you. That's his word, that's his promise. And he goes, all right, I'm going to do it. And I said, good. Next morning, he was up, very anxious, all excited, opening his Bible, just doing what I did, taking notes and underlining. A week goes by. Paul, my time is half up. Yep. One more week, I get to throw away my Bible. I said, I would too. Three more days, you saw me, I was faithful every day. Yep. Three more days, I get to leave the church. I said, I'm right behind you. Two more days, and it's over. Yep. One day, you saw me, I was faithful. Yes, the day arrives. His two weeks are up. But he said nothing. He just got up, read his Bible. Next day, same thing. Next day, same thing. A whole week goes by. And finally, I'm up in the morning, and he says, uh, you know, my two weeks are up. And I said, yeah, I know. You know what I found out? What's that? I can't get along in this life without God. And my friend, that's exactly it. This world is full of too many temptations, too much pain, too much suffering. You're not going to get along without God. You've got to have God. So if you're interested in taking that two-week challenge, I want you to sign up. And what I want you to do, if you want to take this challenge, is print your first name on a piece of paper that we're going to give you. Now, we all know what printing means, don't we? It's a space between each letter, because I have to read these for the next two weeks. So if you will print your first name, do not put your last name. I do not do last names. You see, sometimes I'm praying for four and 500 people. So years ago, I made a deal with God. I do the first name, you do the last name. So now you've got two of us praying for you. God, the last name, me, your first name. 
And I'll tell you something else that's going on special in this church that's only happened one other time before in the thousands of people I've given this to. Your pastor, Gary, said, I want a copy of those names because I want to pray for my church who's doing this for two weeks. It's the second time only in my ministry this has ever happened. You got a good man here. He's going to pray for you because he has you in his heart. So that's your challenge. I want you to put the number 15 beside your name and see what God can do. Could be really good, or it could be really challenging. It's whatever you need to draw closer to him. Amen? Now, there's another group I'd like to address. Maybe you're already reading your Bible and your prayers. That's good. But maybe you're realizing in the time that we're living that it's almost over. You need to step it up. You need to start spending more time in Bible study and prayer. If you're in that group, what I want you to do is print your first name and put a plus beside your name. And when I see that plus, as your pastor, God, and I pray for you, we're going to ask God to bless you as you increase your time with him. Now there's a third and final group that I want to address, and I have to give you a little background on this so you'll understand. When I was pastoring my second church, it was a big one, Sacramento Central Church, over a thousand members. My part in that church was I was collegiate pastor because Sacramento State University was right across the street from Sacramento Central Church. So that was my mission field. And boy, for me, that's a candy store because those students have lots of questions and we have lots of answers. I also taught a collegiate Sabbath school in the upstairs balcony at that church. And then every Friday night, I was in charge of the singles, having all kinds of activities and events for the singles in the church. Uh, and I also taught Wednesday night prayer meeting. So I was a busy boy and I loved it. Anyway, one of my students in the collegiate Sabbath school class was having to go back to Europe. And his name was Zoran Sorjan. What a musical name. Zoran said, Bo, please, you come to Europe, come to my country. I said, Zoran, if I go to Europe, I'll let you know. Well, it was about two years later, I was invited with this crusade team to go to Russia. We had the evangelist who was going to be teaching all the Bible. We had a professional singer, recording artist. We had two people that would take care of the children. And then we brought a Russian translator with us so that we would have some extra help. Well, I let Zoran know, Zoran, I'm going to Russia in October. Do you want me to come and see you in September on my way in? Or do you want me to see you in November on the way out? And he said, oh, bull, bull. I said, both? Yes, you come with us in September, go to Russia October, you come back to us in November. I said, Zoran, two months? He said, Paul, ever since I come home, I tell everybody what you teach us. There are pastors waiting for you in Italy, in Germany, in Austria, in Croatia. I said, really? I said, oh, Paul, they're going to go crazy when you come. I said, let's do it. So I flew into Munich, Germany. He drove up to Munich, picked me up, brought me back to his little village of Kranskogora, Slovenia. Now to us, that's an unknown city. But in Europe, it's very well known because it's a famous ski resort at the base of the Julian Alps. And so when I arrived that first morning, I grabbed my Bible and I hiked up the side of the mountain to have some time alone with God in nature. And as I got up there, I came up to this big, huge open area where there were thousands of wildflowers God had planted just for me. Yes, and they heard me coming. Paul's here. <laughs> and when I stepped into that field of flowers, I said, well, hello. How nice to have company with you. And I sat down in the middle of this field of flowers with the sunlight pouring over me reading my Bible and praying. After a couple of days, the Lord seriously spoke to my heart. And he said, Paul, you're going to be traveling thousands of kilometers 
over the next three months. I said, I know, Lord, I'm so excited. You're going to be meeting tens of thousands of people while you're there. I said, yes. Paul, they cannot see you. They have to see my son, Jesus. I said, absolutely, Lord, that's what I want. And God said to me, in order for that to better happen, I need you to start tithing your time alone with me. I went, tithing my time? 10% of 24 hours? Lord, I have places to go, things to do, people to see. But hey, if you want it, you got it. And on September 17th, 1991, in the Julian Alps, I committed to tithing my time every day alone with God in Bible study and prayer. Now, I can't tell you it's been 100% since 1991. There have been some crises and there's been some emergencies, but I'll tell you what, it's been very, very close that God has allowed me to tithe my time with him. So if you're in that group and you would like to tithe your time with him for the next two weeks, I want you to write the word tithe beside your name. And when I see that, your Pastor Gary and I and God are going to be praying that God blesses you as you take this challenge of tithing your time. Now, do you know how much 10% of 24 hours is? Well, I found out how many minutes it was, and that really surprised me. 10% of 24 hours is 144 minutes. Recognize that number? There's a group of people in the Bible called the 144,000. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. And I believe the reason why they know how to follow Him is because they're spending 144 minutes a day learning just how to follow Him wherever He goes. Now that number shows up several times in our lives. God said, six days shall you labor and do all your work. Do you know six days is 144 hours? God said, I want you to spend a 24-hour Sabbath with me. Do you know 24 hours is 1,440 minutes? So that number shows up three times in our lives. We work six days, 144 hours. We spend a Sabbath. 1,440 minutes. And if you want, if you want, you can spend 144 minutes a day learning how to follow him wherever he goes. So pastor is going to pass around some clipboards right now. Early church has already signed up, and now it is your turn to sign up. And tell me what you want to commit to. Now, only put one of these beside your name so I can pray specifically for you. I have people putting in all three, and I don't know what they're doing. Neither do they. So just tell me if you want to begin with 15 minutes, if you want to increase by adding your time, or if you want to tithe your time, and that way I can be very specific as I pray for you for the next two weeks. Now... You may say, wow, what am I going to do for 144 minutes? Or what am I going to do for 15 minutes? Well, 15 is pretty basic. What I want you to do with the 15 is read your Bible and pray. All right? That's beginning. Read your Bible and pray. Now, for those who want to do more, you want to add to your time, there's a variety of things you can do. And I'll share with you some of the things that I do to have my time with God. One of the things I do is I read widely spiritual books, Christian books. And because I've got a lot of great Christian friends in the ministry and in mission work, they're always telling me, Paul, you got to read this book. This has got to be your next book. Sometimes they'll even mail me a book to make sure I'll read it. And I'm reading two or three books at the same time. In the morning, I'll read one book. And in the afternoon, I'll read another one. And in the evening, I'll read another book. But I'm reading, reading, reading. 
I heard a conference president once say at an ordination for ministers, this conference president said, you know, us leaders can tell which pastors are reading and which pastors are not reading. We know the readers from the non-readers. So you want to be one of those readers. You want to be known and recognized for your walk with God. So, read good books. My favorite book after the Bible, as we taught all this last week, was Steps to Christ. For those of you who missed it, we're going to try to have it available with you shortly on DVDs so that you can look at it again. But, spend that time and that 15 minutes and pick good books. Not in the 15 minutes, excuse me. In the 15 minutes, it's just Bible. 15 minutes is only Bible. But beyond that, some of my favorite books, some of you know Ty Gibson. He's a personal friend of mine. Two of his books really spoke to my heart, Shades of Grace and Seeing Through New Eyes. And of course, I love Morris Vinden's books. He's got 30 or 40 of them, I guess. I own half of them because <laughs> I love Morris Vinden books. They're simple, they're clear, and they're all very basic on getting that relationship going with God. That's the critical factor. That started the great controversy, a broken relationship. It's going to finish the great controversy by healing that relationship between us and with him as well. Pilgrim's Progress is another outstanding book to read by John Bunyan. This book is about a young man named Pilgrim who's making his way to the celestial city. And he runs into problems with anger, uh, fear, disappointment. But he also runs into encouragers like hope and faith and trust. It's a very, very outstanding allegory on Christian growth and Christian walks. Uh, some other books that I like, uh, non-Adventist, Max Lucado. Love his books, really good. They gotta be simple for me because I'm kind of a simple guy. Another one is Philip Yancey. I heard about Philip Yancey when Dwight Nelson mentioned him at Andrews, saying that um, Philip Yancey's book, What's So Amazing About Grace, was an outstanding book. So I got the book, and it was. I must have got five sermons out of that book. I just finished his newest book, just called Prayer. That's it, Prayer. Philip Yancey, really excellent book. Oh, by the way, this is where I got the call to tithe my time. This was my Damascus location. This is the Julian Alps where I spent my time in God, with God alone before I began my three-month tour throughout Europe and Russia. Other things you can do is memorize Bible verses. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Now, the way I memorize Bible verses that makes it easier is like if I want to memorize I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me I take a piece of paper and I put the first letter of each word on that paper I C D A T and so when I look at that that helps me to memorize it because I go now oh, I can do all things and I keep going it over and over again I, I put it on the table I put it in my room so that I'll be seeing those letters all the time and going over and over again throughout the day. Memorize scripture. During your time alone with God, you can sing some gospel songs. After I spend my time in the Bible alone, my first hour in the morning is Bible only. That's it, only Bible, one hour. I read Old and New Testament. And then later on, I'll go on a prayer walk thinking about what I had read in the scriptures that morning. So I go on a prayer walk. That's a wonderful way to activate yourself, to oxygenate your brain, and to talk with God with a strong, clear mind. So that's just a number of the things that I do, but you can be creative and come up whatever you would like to do in spending your time in meaningful devotions with God and let God do wonderful things not only in your life, but the purpose is to help you do it in somebody else's life as well. Now, there are some Bible verses that I think will be helpful for you as you take this two-week challenge. And you might want to jot them down 
or memorize them. Acts chapter 1, verse 8 says that you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. So what I want you to really focus in for these two weeks is having more of the Holy Spirit in your life because then you'll be giving power to be his witness. God does not give us the Holy Spirit so we can walk on water. He does not give us the Holy Spirit so we can turn rocks into bread. He gives us the Holy Spirit so that we will be his witnesses, telling other people about the God that we love. Now these next three verses, Matthew 7, 7, Mark 11, 24, and John 14, 13, are pretty much the same. These three verses say, ask and it shall be given to you, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be open unto you. <laughs> now, here's what Ellen White has to say about those three verses. My brothers and sisters, plead for the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're going to be doing for the next two weeks. We're going to be pleading for the Holy Spirit into our lives. God stands back of every promise he has made. With your Bibles in your hands, tell God, I have done as thou hast said, I present thy promise. And then she quotes these next three verses. You can hold God to it, that you're going to ask, you're going to seek, and you're going to knock, and he's going to respond. He's promised. So she's telling us, hold him to it. Another verse, Isaiah 50, verse 4, is one I used to read out loud to God before I jumped into bed when I was a brand new baby Adventist. All this stuff was new to me. But I used to, before I went to bed, open up Isaiah 50, verse 4, put my finger on it, and read it out loud to God to remind him. It says, He wakeneth me morning by morning. He inclines my ear to listen as a disciple. I said, God, you wake me up in the morning. You speak to me. You told me you would do this in Isaiah, so I'm going to hold you to it. Another good text, 1 Timothy 6.12. It tells us to fight the good fight of faith. Too many people are fighting the bad fight of sin and they're losing. There's only one person who fought the bad fight of sin and won. Who was that? That was Jesus. So the fight is over. What are you doing getting in a fight that's finished? That fight is over. That's not your fight. You are not called to fight sin. You are called to fight for your faith. How do you fight for your faith? exactly what you're going to do for the next two weeks. Bible study and prayer and tell somebody what you got from that experience. That's how you fight your faith. For it, to get it. That's why it's called the good fight. Because you will always win when you fight for your faith. Because God is on your side to see to it, you're going to win this fight. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, during the next two weeks, you may get a new temptation you've never had before. Or an old one may come back on you that you thought you were finished with. But 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, when that temptation comes to you, it says that he will provide a way of escape. Good promise in 1 Corinthians 13. He's going to help you get through. Now, in Philippians, there's actually three verses that I like. The Philippians is one of my favorite books because every chapter talks about joy and rejoicing. I like the book of Philippians. Well, you know in Philippians chapter 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Wonderful song. I hum that often. Anyway, in Philippians 4, 8, it tells us what we're supposed to be thinking about for the next two weeks. Not about Biden, please. Not about the wars going on in the world. Don't go there. Here's what you're supposed to be thinking about, Philippians 4, 8. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are noble, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Why? It's going to lift you up. It's going to draw you close to God. Think on these things. Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And verse 19, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. How can you possibly lose? It's all right there. Those weren't written for you to read. Those were written for you to use. Use these. Claim these. Recite them. Matthew eleven thirty. 
Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to be perfect, but compared to the yoke Satan wants you to wear, Jesus' yoke is easy. It's light. I know, I've worn both. Some of you have. The Satan, that yoke that Satan puts on you is heavy and he pushes down. But the one that Jesus gives you, he carries with you. And he carries the heaviest part. His yoke is easy. It's light. You'll know when you've carried both of them. Take Jesus' yoke. And then I don't want you to forget James 4.8. You just recite this, recite this during your two-week challenge. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. That's a promise that he's going to keep. When I went to that trip to Russia, the meetings were held in the Palace of Soldiers. Big, beautiful, magnificent building. And I'm up front there in the white t-shirt with my translator, Leonard Fonda. Guy was a brilliant man, and we got to be very, very close friends spending that month together. He would go with me during the daytime to the universities, to the high schools, to help translate, and we just had an amazing relationship together for that month. And the place was packed. 2,000 people a night jammed that palace. They were along the walls, all over the floors, everywhere you could squeeze a person. They wanted to see and hear. Well, I remember my part was the 10-minute health talk before the Bible study. So I gave a 10-minute health message each night. And on the left-hand side, about 30 rows back, I saw a very striking, distinguished-looking woman. I found out later she was a doctor, Helen Popov. And I noticed that when I was making my presentations, there were tears coming down her face. And I couldn't figure out why she had tears when I'm talking about health. But the crusade went on, and during the day I was running around to all the universities and high schools, and being an American, that was a gold ticket. If you're an American, they will cancel classes. You come and speak. By the way, do you know Tom Cruise? <laughs> no, I don't. The bad thing is he doesn't know me. So anyway, at the end of the crusade, Dr. Helen made a decision to get baptized. And she came up to me personally, and she said, Paul, before my baptism, I would like to talk with you privately, alone. Can we do that? And I said, absolutely. So we went off into the side room in the palace. We sat down, and she said, I did not come here to learn about God. And I said, you didn't? She said, no. In fact, I hated God. The only reason I came is because a few weeks ago, giant posters appeared all over the city. Six live Americans at the Palace of Soldiers. I wanted to see a live American with my very own eyes. And I wanted to brush up on my English. And I said, I understand. And she said, I need to tell you why I hated God. My grandfather was an Orthodox Christian, and he used to read the Bible to my parents when they were little. The family Bible took three volumes to fill. They would hide two of them under the floorboard, and then they would keep one out to read every night. But they covered it with a towel during the day so nobody would see it because it was against the law to read the Bible to the children. But he did it anyway. Well, one very hot night, they opened up the windows and the doors, and the neighbors upstairs heard him reading the Bible to the children. They called the KGB. In the middle of the night, they smashed into the apartment, tore it to pieces looking for the Bible. They found it, and they ripped it to shreds not knowing that the other two volumes were under the floor. And he was arrested, and he was sent to the gulags of Siberia. For the next 70 years, until he died, 
he was beaten, starved, and freezing because he dared read the Bible to his children. He never saw his children grow up. He never saw his grandchildren. He died alone in Siberia because he was reading the Word of God. When Dr. Helen grew up, she had two children, a boy and a girl, and when his, her boy became a teenager, he said, Mom, I want a Bible. She said, what for? I want to see what it's about, what it, what's in it. And she said, there are two volumes left from your great-grandfather. I will pass them on to you. They mean nothing to me, but you can read them, but do not discuss it with me. I want nothing to do with God. So he eagerly grabbed the Bibles, and because he had volume one, he had Genesis. And it was there that he read that Adam and Eve were eating from Mother Earth, the plants. And he said, that's it. I'm a vegetarian. That's what God gave Adam and Eve. That's what I'm going to do. His teachers told him, if you do not eat meat, you will die. He said, if I die, I die but I'm going to follow what I found in Genesis. Well, by the time he graduated from high school, he was a star athlete. He went into the military, and because of his physical prowess and strength, he was respected by the other soldiers. But because of his honesty and integrity as a Christian, he was admired by the officers. He never lied, he never stole, he never cheated. He was a Christian from reading the book the Bible. During Perestroika, there wasn't a lot of military activity, so the soldiers were sent out at the end of the season to harvest the produce, the beets and the cabbage and the carrots and so on. And so they were working late one night, and because there are not a lot of street lights, they can't work much after dark, but they wanted to finish the field so they wouldn't have to come back the next day. So they worked until a little later, and it was really dark, and they loaded everything up, and they started driving back in the darkness of night. And the driver missed one of the curves and tumbled over the embankment. And Dimitri, her only son, was killed that night, one month before we arrived. And again, she shook her fist at God. First, my grandfather suffers in Siberia, and now my only son and both of them were following you. God, I hate you. But she said, when I saw those giant posters, I had to come. And Paul, when you got up each night and spoke about health, you reminded me of my boy. And that's why tears were coming down my face, because he died one month ago before your arrival. Because of what I've heard and what I understand, I've made my commitment now to a loving God. He's not the God I thought he was. And because of your sacrifice and your willingness to come and help my people, I want to give you a gift from my heart. I want you to have one of the two volumes left of our family Bible. This Bible is as old as the United States. It is so old, it was written before the Russian language was finished. I've had linguists look at this book, and they said, this book is a blend of four Slavic languages, because there was no Russian language at that time that was written. And she said, Paul, I want you to have this book. And when you take it back to America, you tell our brothers and sisters that our Bibles are covered with blood and with tears because they were so precious to us. I said, I know. Our Bibles are covered with dust, and that's why they mean so little to us. Paul, Paul, tell our brothers and sisters, this is a holy book written by a holy God for a holy people. Tell them to read it. Tell them to read it. Please read this book. 
I said, I will. I promise. I showed it to the conference president, and he said, Paul, this is a national treasure. You will never get through customs with this book. They will send it to the Hermitage, our famous museum, like the Smithsonian in the US, and it will be out on display for the Russians to see their history. And I said, if God wants me to have this book, I'll have it. Well, obviously you know who won. When we got up to the customs at the airport, the other five Americans had gone through and I watched what was happening. There was a big metal table. They put their bags on the table and then they opened them up and the soldiers went flying through anything that they, <laughs> they said you couldn't have, which was really they wanted. Oh, this is not, no, you can't have this. <laughs> so I thought, oh boy, they're gonna get me. Anyway, they had all finished and every time I started going up to the turnstile, it's a metal bar. Once you pass that bar, you cannot go back. And I would get right up to the turnstile, and those brothers would grab me and pull me back. I said, Paul, wait, wait, we have another question. We want to ask you something else. We want to hold you one more time. And I said, yeah, I've got to get going. Finally, the American said, Paul, door's going to close. You've got to get going now. I said, okay, I've got to go. So then the pastor came up to me, and he grabbed me, and he held me close. He said, I will not let you go unless you promise you will come back to the motherland. And I said, if it's God's will, I'll come back. Well, it was, and that's another story. So I went up to the turnstile and everybody was gone. In fact, there was only one soldier left. And so I walked up and he figured I was with the group. And he said, Amerikansky? And I said, da da, da da, yes, yes. And uh, I put my bags up on the thing and he said, Take them quickly. And I looked at him and I said, Spasiba Bolshoi, which means thank you very much. And he said, Pajalsta, you're welcome. And then I looked at him and I said, Blaglas Lavi Vas Boga, God bless you. And he said, Harasho, okay. He didn't open those bags because had he done, that Bible might not be with me. Now, I take it everywhere in the world I travel, except Russia. <laughs> if you'd like to take a look at this afterwards, I'd be happy to show it to you, but I'll ask you not to touch it. I've already had two pages ripped and the binding broken because people were very clumsy with a rare treasure. So I am the only one to handle the book. I will be happy to show you some pages, some of the etchings that are inside, but I'll ask you, do not touch the book. Please respect me. All right? Well, inside this Bible is a, well, is a picture of Dr. Helen and her baptismal day. She was just radiant. On the left was her son's best friend. In front of her, uh, in the white blouse was uh, Dimitri's sister. And then there's Dr. Helen there in the back. That's me in the tie. And on the right was Dimitri's fiance the girl he was going to marry. So these were the closest people to him that came for that day of the baptism, which was a wonderful experience. Also inside this Bible is a photograph of her son, Dimitri, the young soldier who died one month before we arrived. And on the back of this photograph, she wrote me a note. To Paul, the man who gave me a hope. This is my son, my pride, my happiness, my life, my grief, my Dimitri. Paul, I will spend the rest of the days of my life waiting for that moment when my boy and you are going to meet each other in heaven. I'm looking forward to that day too. And boy, won't Dimitri be surprised that his Bible was in America. <laughs> the last chapter of Great Controversy. There's a quote from Scripture, Eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. 
And then the rest of the chapter says, this is exciting. In heaven, every faculty will be developed. Every capacity increased. There, the grandest enterprises may be carried forward and the loftiest aspirations reached, the highest ambitions realized, <laughs> and still there will arise new heights to surmount, new wonders to admire, new truths to comprehend. Man, I got to be there. I got to be there. I don't want to miss this. And God has made sure we can be there forever. I've learned to simplify my life as a Christian. I understand there are only two things that are important, God and people. Everything else burns when Jesus comes. Only two things important, God and people. You only have two needs. Quit chasing around all the other needs that you think you have. The advertisers will tell you, oh, you need this, you need this, you need that. No, 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 no. You only have two needs, just two. And if you get these, your life will be full. The first need is to be loved. The second need is to give love. And then I only have two goals in my life. <laughs> you know, in college, they tell you, write down all the goals that you have. I only have two. Two goals. God made it simple. The first goal is to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit in my life, found in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. That's my first goal. My second goal is to help somebody else have that same experience. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. There it is. My closing text, which I always close all of my presentations before I leave, and that's Acts chapter 20 and verse 32. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among those who are saved. My brothers and sisters, I leave you now in the hands of God and this book. It will build you up, and it will give you the inheritance among those who are saved. And we will get to go to a place where Jesus is going to say, Welcome home. This is the place I've prepared for you. You don't want to miss it.